Hello, David Macmillan here. A while back, I did a piece on stuff. The different kind of things we just build up in our lives. The sheer quantity of it. The variety of it. And how we always seem to get more, perhaps without even really thinking about it. But now, we move on. What about that stuff? What does it tell us about ourselves? Never mind the quantity of what we have. What about the things themselves? What about the quality of it? What does it say about us? The things we desire, the things we chase, the things we must possess. You are what you eat, say the nutritionists. But what eats at you is what you are too. Even as hunter-gatherers, we weren't much above the rest of the primates, except, I suppose, by being homo sapiens, we were a little bit smarter, and we got somebody else to do the hunting and most of the gathering. Well, we just kept it. Soon enough, weather permitting, we had civilization, and that meant objects and craftspeople working away at things, things that we wanted. I guess I started to obsess over objects quite early, as most kids do, my particular passion was for collecting matchbox labels. And collectors are true obsessors over every item from uh, sports cars to luxury watches. But at nine or ten, these labels meant everything to me. They came in sets of 64, and I won't bore you with the details, but they were different enough, each set, to have a theme, some were wildflowers, there was vintage cars and ancient Rome, but that was a bit before my time. But that collection, nobody had. They had all been thrown away, those matches, so I went hunting for them. And when I found them, I truly felt like an explorer, like some ancient digger in Egypt finding a tomb. I craved those things. I craved exotic and unusual labels from Bryant and May, the match company, so much that I'd spend whole weekends on my skateboard patrolling the laneways of the highways for matchboxes to pick up and check the labels. I went further. I'd go down to the docks, and me and my friend, he'd lower me down on a rope so I could get between the gigantic trade ships and pick up a few boxes that were sitting on those planks that stopped the waves from splashing up between the ship and the dock. A few exotic ones, but not enough, never enough. At school, from an eight-year-old far wiser than uh, I was, Brian Carlson was his name, he sold me the plans to the matchbox factory, that is, the plans of how to get into it at the weekends when it was closed. As a ten-year-old, I took those plans and found my way to the right location, climbed the right fence, opened the correct light well that was into a shower, climbed down, roamed around and found huge skips full of old matchboxes. And plenty of new ones as well. Some of them, after diving in and rolling around like a rich man dives in this money tray, I grew bored with that because I had the whole year's series. So I went scratching further. I got into air vents. I got into where the presses were. I even opened up a huge chimney, the suction from the top wind nearly dragging me in at my tender age. There I found, just inches out of range, a label that looked so old I, I almost lost an arm trying to get it out. I did, and it was, I think, to the Greek Olympics was a series of 64 that year. And that, in fact, went back to 1963, that said. I had it. I felt, I guess, as were those who found the Dead Sea Scrolls. No greater happiness. But I knew what obsession was. Now, let's look at your particular obsessions. I don't know what they are, but are they public or private? What I mean is... Could you share them with anybody else? Could you invite somebody in to look at your collection? Would they enjoy it as much as you? If it's painting or sculpture, 
Then it's slightly more elevated, because at least others could enjoy it. But of course you might want to have it privately, and if indeed it's a stolen painting, you'd have no choice. Paintings get stolen from time to time, and I do wonder who enjoys them, how they enjoy it. Like some private pornographer, or just the joy of having something that nobody else has. That's a very weak joy. I think few of us would argue that um, jewellery, gemmed watches and clothing all fit into the category of though you might obsess over them and desire them, they're really nothing more than showing off. So if those are your obsessions, then you care about your status amongst your fellow human beings. Next, when thinking about the things that you must have, is quantity an issue? Is more of it a good thing? If you're saying money, then that's really not an object of desire. That's just a, a representation, a tool. I mean, when it comes to money, we're just as happy with numbers on a screen from online banking as having trillions stacked up in a warehouse someplace. In fact, probably happier, because that makes for an uncomfortable sleep, having cash in a warehouse. Indeed it does, because for some reason it never stays put. Well, really. Why? Because you needed help to get it in there, you fool. That's why. Did you really think it was going to stay? No, money is not one of the objects of desire that I mean. Of the things you must possess, is uniqueness important? I don't mean just rarity, like a stamp that uh, nobody else has got. Remember that old one from British Guiana sold recently for, uh, what was it, eight million? It's being shared by a number of people. Now that's unique, all right. But does uniqueness in the, the object, the, perhaps the workmanship on it or the, the style of it is could only be done by a particular hand, does that count very highly? And is it important that it is unique or that it happens to be unique? Separate the things that just mean status to the things you really obsess about. Mostly, they're private. Many people list cars as, the, as their objects of desire, but they're a fuzzy area to me because though some of them can look very, very good, like a Bugatti Royale, it's the performance that either drags it up or twists it sideways. So that really is a, is a lever on it. So when thinking about cars as the greatest object of your interest, what is it about them? Is it the power they have? Is it the strongest car? Does it beat all the other cars? Or is it the look of the thing? The, some joy at the lines and the machining around it. That, I like to think, is on a somewhat different level from the power, because if it's just power, surely it can't be the speed that's important. It's a powerlessness that you must feel if it's only the power about a car that attracts you. But for most serious car collectors, I don't think power is the great thing. I wonder if anyone shares my delight in handmade boxes of all kinds, particularly when fashioned from wood. I do a few myself, well, I used to, especially the boxes that have a secret way of opening them that doesn't require a tool, or perhaps a tool that's somehow built into the box that you can access. If I came across a handmade box, I particularly note the the lines in the wood, the grain of it, how much that was exposed, what sort of level of polishing was involved, how the joins matched up, any inlay, how many levels to go through to open the damn thing. What that told me was there, were, there was a human hand behind it and some thought and a lot of care and dedication. So these little boxes, am I rating it too highly for what I say about them? Or I just got a dark obsession over containers, capture, and confinement. Think hard about your own.
In my defense, I like to see myself as a bit of a curator of things. That is, the unique and carefully made objects that I desire, even these little, sometimes ancient boxes. I'm not the owner in the sense that uh, I possess it and no one else must know and no, mu no one else must see. But I'm preserving it from a harsh and cruel world that would see it crushed or lost. Uh, we've almost a thought of many things that were lost in our personal pasts, as well as throughout history. Uh, everyone wants to know if there was an Ark of the Covenant. Well, it's another box, but there you are. That's what I know. Here's the next level in your study of your own obsessions. Is the acquiring of it very important? That is, does it matter whether you have a load of money and uh, just sat there online or had your servants go to an auction at Sotheby's and do the bidding? The getting of it, was that important? If, on the other hand, you had to traipse through jungles, bribe officials, smuggle the item out, uh, then, then, how does it fit? Is it only that when you see that object, that uh, crystal skull, that it reminds you of all the adventures you ever had, and that's what makes the object precious, yearned for? You'll know that when there's a slight sadness when you actually get the thing that you desire. Unfortunately, that applies to so many things. When I first began smuggling things across borders, I would find, after going to a lot of trouble to fund the thing, to uh, work out a plan to get it across the border, to construct some device in which to pack it, to recruit the people that would help me, to carry out the operation, to deal with whatever disaster or opportunity presented itself in that travel, that journey, I would find that when I crossed that last border, when I was more than safely in the car park, then I'd driven off and opened the stash and put it safely to bed, there would be a kind of letdown. I don't know whether this is felt by anybody who achieves a goal, runners beating their personal best or climbers getting on top of that hill without running out of oxygen, some kind of deflation as they have achieved their goal. I certainly felt that with just about anything I was smuggling. And really, I didn't want to see my stuff go into others' hands. Now, why was that? Was I just a greedy bastard who didn't want to let go of anything? Didn't want to share? Not so much that. The kind of people that bought my smuggled goods, well, I was a little contemptuous of their money because they hadn't gone through the same amount of effort that I had to find it. I had to even find that it was findable by getting the right people to locate it getting them up from the gutter or the mountaintop or wherever they came from. That was certainly part of it. Now, giving it to people who would, well, were somehow undeserving of it and would treat it badly, to give a shimmering, iridescent, nacreescent, that's the word, it's kind of mother-of-pearl effect on the cocaine and with their own little stamped identities, the Peruvian bird, the circle, ah, so many. To hand that over to somebody who would, what, smash it to pieces? Rape it with adulterance? Bang it up, suffocate it? Store it carelessly? Risk getting it taken away by people who would throw it in an evidence bag and then a courtroom and... Well, and then claim to have destroyed it in the interests of the nation. Making the world safer? No, I didn't really want any of my stuff to go. Not into these kind of people's hands. I apologized to every ounce that I left. So what can I say of your obsessions, the objects that 
drive you forward, that you dream of, that you plan to get? Are they things that get labeled, that have a sticker, that have some kind of certificate of authenticity? No, take a step backwards. Are they things that you can see at a careful study are things of quality? Take a step forward. Are they things that tell of a past, tell of a cities, people, civilization that is no longer within our reach, that has joined the great past of the lost? Yes. And do you want to keep that information safe in that object? And then take two steps forward. Are your objects things you want to tell people about? Is it important that you tell them about them? Is it important that you keep them away from them? They're behind a glass case, your SS dagger or your plate. Hmm. You're stepping deeply backwards. Take a step forward if you know the time in your life that this takes, that it's not overwhelming, that it's really a kind of an entertainment, or it has some function in preservation of something of quality. If it overwhelms you, and you use it as a place to hide, then that highlights another problem. So there it is. How do you see the objects of your desire now? Are they things that you share? Are they things that you concern yourself with their commercial value? Are there things that are labeled, that depend on other pieces of paper to prove their worth? Are they things that you enjoy privately? Well, I think we can weed out the great objects from the commonplace. And obsession's fine. It's good to have a bit of a cause. Just one thing. I hope the object of your obsession is never a fellow human being, is never a person. That is a deep hole into which you need not step, and hopefully that you will not lead someone else. In my time through some quite terrible prisons, I met some people who were collectors of others, and you might wonder what they did with them. Did they do unspeakable things? Hmm. Not as often as you'd think, but terrible enough. Did they care for them? Certainly, they wanted to be... They wanted them to be as in their imagination. That was a key thing. Their captive, their prisoner, was maintained. But here's the terrible thing. They had no real plan. They just wanted to possess. If that thought puts you off the idea of collecting anything, let it not. There are exceptions in every case. It would be good to have uh, a $10,000 note. Yes, printed between, I can't quite remember, but I think in the 20s or teens, certainly up until 1944, with the portrait of Salmon Portland Chase. Not too many around. They say there's a few hundred left. Let me know what you obsess over, and we'll see what comes of that. Of course, there's always something that'd be extraordinary to find. I'd really like to find a timepiece. Doesn't matter made by who, but, say, at least 15,000 years old. A clock made before the dawn of our modern civilization, what, uh, 10,000 a bit more years ago, that would mean they failed, they were lost. And yet it happened. Yeah. <laughs> I'd frame that one, just to say we can always lose it again. So watch it. <laughs>